Uh, thank you all for joining us, obviously. Uh, Assistant Majority Leader Jason Monks, uh, Majority Caucus Chair Megan Blanksma, and Speaker of the House Scott Bedke. Well, uh, we just, we'll just do a little opening statement here. If I'm, when I go home and I talk to my friends that are not necessarily plugged into every little movement here in the State House, they're going to ask me, what did you guys do this year? You know, what did you do that is going to affect regular Idahoans? And I think that is a, is a good, significant list. Number one, we accomplished the largest uh, tax cut in the state's history, including a direct refund check to all Idahoans. We have uh, made major in, uh, investments in our infrastructure. All of the road systems in Idaho, whether they're managed by the states or the local, uh, we've made a major investment there. In addition, we've fully funded the, the education system. And we've maintained our commitment to the teachers with the career ladder. Uh, we have, uh, they will be in receipt of a, a large amount of this federal money, north of $500 million that will plug in to, to be used in, in the K-12 system uh, and a like amount in the higher ed system. So we have maintained our commitments to the education system. At the same time, we have uh, increased the homeowner's exemption. That's, that's tax relief to all, all homeowners in the state. We've increased that exemption by 25%. At the same time, you know, uh, my friends will ask me, well, what about that sine die versus recess thing? And, uh, and I will explain to them that what we have done is we've kept our foot in the door in case of the unforese unforeseen this summer. And so it maintains our checks and balance system. I don't anticipate th that uh, our putting anything to, into effect unless there's another big chunk of federal money. And we're talking a large chunk. This would have to be something north of our regular give and take that we get from the federal government, which is usually around $15 million uh, stops it usually every year. And so if we get some big unexpected thing, then that's what uh, the House has done. We've kept our foot in the door, if you will. The Senate has signed he died with our uh, concurrence. So we're adequate uh, constitutionally, but if we need to uh, start it back up again, then we were able to do that and, uh, bring, and the Senate would, would join us. So that's what we've done. Uh, the, the AGs uh, has a letter that will be coming out that, it, that will explain this uh, to everyone and, uh, and we'd like, we look forward to your questions. Can I also jump on? I just, sure. just um, a couple, couple things really quickly because um, while I appreciate the governor's ability to sign his name and take credit for other people's hard work, <laughs> I just want to point out that these big transportation packages the, um, and all of the tax cuts, these were efforts from House members and, and they put in a lot of hard work and effort to put these packages together. And I, I, I appreciate the press releases from the governor's office, but those folks really need to be recognized for the hard work that they put in. So we have Chairman Palmer, who put in a great deal of work for that transportation package to provide those funds. We had um, <coughs> Chairman Harris that worked really hard to provide those income tax cuts. And then we also had um, Representative Moyle, our majority leader, who worked really hard over the entire session to put together the property tax package. And, and it's disingenuous to say that that came together in just a day or two. That was an effort on his part over the entire session. So I just, I feel compelled as caucus chairman to make sure that um, people understand that, that our members really worked hard on these big packages and, and should get some credit for that. So. So we'll start with questions uh, from the room here. If anyone has any. Uh, Mr. Tigger, hey, Keith. How, how, if you want to call the legislature back in the session, how do you see it working? What's the, technically, what's the process? How's it going Well, we'll do it with the advice and consent of all of the members. They will have to, this won't be a unilateral call. This will, when we have critical mass within the House and, frankly, the Senate, that there, that there's, um, that there's need, then that would that would be what triggers it. It won't be, we will keep special sessions special, 
and it won't this, this won't be for just the mundane uh, everyday things so you're, you're saying that the Senate um, before you call the house back <coughs> you talk to Senate leadership and the Senate leadership would say yeah it's a good idea well Keith if that's the legislative process if we have to conduct business that's a bike we will have to do that in a bicameral way and so uh, it, it will do no good for us to call ourselves just the house in if there's not uh, some understanding, some acquiescence on the Senate side. Now that's not, you know, when they chose to sign a die, and uh, depending on how that all works, we'll, we'll see. We are a little bit in uncharted territory here, but uh, I believe that this maintains the check and balance system, uh, particularly in the area of appropriation that is, that is you know, that is clearly a legislative uh, constitutional responsibility. Uh, the legislative process. Of course, the governor's right in the middle of that as well, and so this would allow us to 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 bring that into effect. I I only see that happening though, in the case of the unforeseen. We have passed legislation that uh, says if anything having to do with ARPA, that that is anticipated and 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 cannot be classified as non cognizable. I guess the, so. the main question is: Could the House force? the Senate to come back to Boise even if the Senate didn't want to? I don't believe ultimately they could. Uh, it will have to be for mutually uh, approved reasons. Mr. Speaker, from what you're hearing, how likely is it that you can come back? I, uh, as of May 13th, I don't think it's likely. But you tell me what the circumstances will be in August or September or October. And, uh, and then I'll be able to give you a better, a clearer uh, prediction. But uh, this, again, is there if we need it. And I would categorize it that way. Um, Speaker Bed, Keith <coughs> Brown with Idaho Public Television. Uh, my question is about uh, the divide between the Senate and the House. Last night especially, there seemed to be differences in opinion and how to approach uh, Include moving forward, whether that's ARPA funding or uh, any emergency that may come up in the off season. Um, I guess how do you how do you solve that? I mean, uh, the divide between the Senate and the House. The Senate seemed to have strong feelings. All but two voted to sign the die. Right. Um, well, I think you need to look no farther than the uh, concurrent resolution that they that they sent over to us. And that was a way to, uh, number one, to shut off the money. So the money, the per diem, that is all, that is all shut off. But if, they, uh, but, if they, but if they believe that signing die really meant signing die, there would have been no need for that concurrent resolution. And so this is a way, our, our collective actions are a way to hedge against the unforeseen that we talked about earlier. Another one concerning the, as it didn't um, adjourn, there's a lot of administrative rules that is going to be a problem. It looks like now state agencies will have to um, hold public hearings, redo all the rules. There will be a lot of uh, cost and expense, like a quarter billion dollars. Also, buying newspaper ads. Um, was that? Did you think about that when you decided to <coughs> recess rather than adjourn? I think that that was not a unilateral decision on the House's part. Uh, the events of the session led us exactly there. Uh, that you know, having the public participate in a in a relook of the uh, of all of the rule structure just follows up on the red tape reduction act that we have all participated in over the last two years. Now we need to get back to a more normal type of situation. There's still a difference of opinion between the House and the Senate on uh, what it takes to reject a rule. Uh, <clears throat> rules have the full force and effect of law, and if one side rejects that and the other side doesn't, it, it uh, still goes into effect. And anything that has the full force and effect of law, we believe, needs to be treated as, it if, as if it were a law, and it needs to go through a more regular uh, review process. In other words, it needs the concurrence of both the House and the Senate to be the rejected or accepted. Just one, one more question. Um, on referendums, 60 days doesn't start until adjournment, so that means that a referendum 
when it would go in January and February, which seems kind of unfair to Idaho citizens to do that to them. Was that thought well, about in your caucus discussions? Well, it, it, yeah, it came up, and I, I think it, uh, I, it basically extends the, the time period for, for signature collection. That's how we understand it. So I don't see how that's unfair to the proponents that are wanting to, to collect the signatures. They have longer than they normally did. Well, you know, adjourn. They can't start collecting signatures until you adjourn, and if you're not adjourned, that, that's not going to happen until the Well, for all, I, I th and we'll leave that up to the, to the lawyers to decide, but I, I believe that this, it is our understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, it is our understanding that this extends the, the and it has the effect of extending the, the time uh, allowed for signature collection. That was the best opinions that we had as of this last week. Hold on, let's take a virtual question real quick from Melissa Davlin, IBTV. Melissa? Good morning. Um, I, I had a question about that $6 million early childhood grant. When that first came up early on in the session, it failed in the House um, by, by just one vote. And frankly, now the makeup of your caucus has changed. Why not bring that up for a vote again? Because the, quite literally, the votes were not there. As you, uh, you know, as you watched our actions this year, there were several things that were brought up for reconsideration. And those motions failed each time. There's a, there's a thought that uh, we do these things once and then we let that vote stand and we'll take it up again later uh, at, a, at a subsequent session. Ms. Brown, did you have a question? Let Melissa go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, just a, a, a follow up to that. Um, can, can you walk me through how the votes weren't there? Because I, I, for, when I was looking at the original vote count, uh, for the appropriation that died, one of the members who voted no is no longer in the body. So wouldn't that mean that you you would have the votes to pass it by one? Well, that would, if every, if, if there was not fluidity amongst the members, uh, you know, take my, take my word for it, the votes were not there. And uh, we can go around and around on this, but we should concentrate on the other federal money that is available to uh, we are awash in federal money for all of these types of things, including daycare, uh, uh, K-12, pre-K, et cetera. And so uh, these programs will not go wanting uh, for lack of passage of 1193. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my question was regarding 389. Uh, as I was reading the governor's letter, uh, after his signature, as I was reading it, it almost sounded as if it could be a veto letter or a signature letter. Um, so he was uh, critical of 389. Do you see the issue of property taxes uh, coming up again, or is there an alternative way that uh, you could approach it in the next? Well, it just so happens we have a <laughs> member of the Interim Property Tax Committee here. And so I'm going I'm to cede to him, but we, we read that letter carefully as well. Uh, bottom line is, is that it, it lowers, if you're a homeowner, it lowers your property taxes. Now this is, it, it, it's a moderate reduction to be sure, but, uh, and all of the concerns that were in the other part of the bill did not outweigh the, the concerns about taking the uh, exemption off. So that's, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming they agonized about it, but anyway, on balance they passed it. I guess just to follow up with that, um, are, are we done? Absolutely not. A uh, lot more work to do with that. Uh, this was, I think, a, a start. Um, and obviously it takes a bicameral plus the governor uh, approach to be able to get anything done. And I think this was about as far as we could push at this particular juncture, as evidenced by the, the letter that you mentioned from the governor. Would he have gone much further? Um, and, and would the Senate have gone much further? Based on their vote, you see it was about as close as we could get. That was about as far as we could push uh, this year. Uh, th but we've got a lot more work to do on that. We will continue to work on that. But you know, keep in mind, property taxes is, is not a function of the state. That's a function of your local governments. Uh, that's where the property taxes increases come from. Uh, they don't come from the state. And so for us to have to intervene in that is, is um, unfortunate 
in my world that we have to actually get involved in that because it is just strictly a function of local governments and, uh, and what happens there. But we will continue to work on that. We obviously have more concerns there. We have people who are being priced out of their homes, have been there for a lot of years and because of, because of a number of factors and we tried to address some of those factors in 389, but we'll need to continue to uh, do more work on that over the years. You know, so if we go home and we talk to our neighbors, again, those that are not completely plugged in and they're asking, what, what did you do? What, what did you guys do this year that will affect me? We'll come back to the, the, the increase in the, in the homeowner's exemption. And then we'll try to explain how, why their property taxes are going up while the, the state of Idaho is growing. So we have a system that uh, where growth doesn't necessarily pay for growth, part of the established neighborhoods of pro the property owners are also paying for that growth. And we have a system that cranks that out under certain conditions. We are in those conditions right now and it's not necessarily fair to all classes of property. And so this is a, a sticky wicket. Of course, if you're in a fast growing city, you're worried about uh, providing services and that's to be expected. But you would think as the, as the size of the pie increases that everyone's burdens that they have to share with regard to providing those services would get a little lower and they're not. They're, they're staying at least static if not going up each year and we've got to fix that. And so we, as it was said, the budgets are set locally. We set the policy and there's some tweaks that the policy could stand. Let's take some online questions now. And if you have an online question, just do the digital hand up uh, thing so we make sure we get them all answered. Uh, first, uh, Joe Paris, KTVV. Joe. Thanks, Justin. Um, first, I, I'm just curious is there like a, a spelled out uh, technical process on what it would look like for the Senate to come back if the House decided that's what was required? No, there's nothing in. Uh, uh, that is spelled out at this point. We look for direction uh, from the Attorney General's uh, opinion that is that is should be released well, sometime this morning. Yeah, Joe, as soon as we get the letter, we'll have a release and make sure that you guys get that information. Uh, obviously, it's not something we've done before, and so we're looking for guidance, but I'll make sure everybody gets that as soon as we have it available. Okay, and then a quick follow-up. Um, with Senate Bill 1204 being signed into law, is the reason for taking a recess simply um, about concerns of potential future money that could be given to the state over the summer or towards the end of the year and again not necessarily with ARPA funds? That's exactly correct Joe is that everything that we don't know the answer to right now uh, is, our, is the main reason why we left our foot in the door as it were. Well, and we also might want to point out that they changed the guidance for the current ARPA Correct. funds within the last 10 days. So it's a moving target and, and we're just trying to, to be ready for any That's future exactly. moves. <laughs> um, and so to clarify, to clarify, there is trust in Senate Bill 1204 and this isn't some type of a, a move that I guess would be hesitant to leave because they're, the legislature is afraid they wouldn't be called back for future funds. Let's make it clear we are we left this option op open in case of the unforeseen and the unpredicted and that's that's where we're at we do not want to become a full-time legislature uh, we do not want to overstep the legislature's bounds but we do have responsibilities under the Constitution and this allows us in the case of unforeseen to to uh, fulfill those responsibilities uh, I know Ed News had a follow-up question, Kevin, changing <laughs> runner. <laughs> yeah, uh, following up on uh, House Bill, um, Senate Bill 1193 and the Democratic uh, presser a few minutes ago, Senator Stennett suggested that there was a deal in place that the House would revisit 1193 if the Senate moved on legislation regarding House office space. She suggested that, that, deal, that you renege on that deal. There was no deal. There was no deal. So anybody who purports to have made a deal on 1193 is either misinformed or creating a deal that did not exist. That's the first I've heard of that deal. Yeah. <laughs> is there any other deals that we made that we don't know about? <laughs> Because I may have taken that deal, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I now mean, that we know. I, yeah. Wish somebody would have told me about that. Deal. <laughs> All right.
trying to see if the Idaho graph to start to get to it. It's all good. Um, I wanted to ask about the Idaho conservative agenda, um, those legislators that set out some policy goals at the beginning of the session. Um, they met yesterday and praised some of the accomplishments uh, this session. Just wanted to get your thoughts on um, those legislators in general and their impact on the party as a whole. There are multiple um, caucuses that, are, that operate outside of our Republican caucus. So there's that group, there's also a group that's like, what is it, farm and ranch, farm and ranch. that meets, and there's also a um, technology group that also meets, and so I don't know that I have and there's a, a, sportsman's, a, a sportsman's. The sportsman's one. So their operations are not unusual, and that that's outside the purview of the caucus. But coming back to the caucus's agenda, we set five to four distinct goals back in Back last July, number one was to have significant income tax relief plus rebates. Your, our state is performing very well economically, and uh, and your and the taxpayers are sending more money in than we, more Idaho money in than than is needed, and so we will give uh, long-term sustainable, uh, you know, ongoing tax relief with a one-time uh, refund check coming back to all Idahoans. And, at the th and then we wanted to do roads, and we did that. And then we wanted to do something to, on, that improves the property tax situation, so we've done that. We wanted to work with the governor to restore and reset some of the balance of powers issue. Keep in mind the statutes that govern our reaction to emergencies and disasters are over 50 years old, and we did that. Uh, I think we're, and we wanted to create a framework for the receiving of this money so that we could invest it in ways that uh, would benefit future Idaho generations. And I think we've, we've done that. Now the guideline seems to change uh, from time to time. So some of the assumptions that we had before uh, three days ago have been changed and we'll, and we'll roll with, with that as well. But that, those were the goals that we set. And I believe that the House Republican Caucus accomplished its goals. I, I just maybe add to that a little bit. Um, if you go through the list of those goals and those uh, objectives, those are, those are Republican <laughs> goals that uh, I'm talking the, the conservative caucus. Those have been Republican goals for years. They're not new. Um, there's, there's nothing special or different. Um, obviously, we had similar goals that we've gone through the list and checked them off. Uh, and so, you know, we're happy to take support in, in accomplishing our goals no matter where we get that support. And if that comes from the other side of the aisle um, to, to accomplish our goals, we'll take that. We're, we'll take the, the support wherever we can get that support to accomplish the objectives of the Republican Party and the House uh, Republican Caucus. Yeah, we didn't uh, do this screensaver here just the last, uh, in the last couple of days. We went back to our, our meetings that we had with the caucus early in January, and voila, the boxes are checked. <laughs> Uh, Representative Weissman sent out a press release recently regarding uh, safe workplace. Uh, I'm not sure if it was training or I can't see her behind the camera. I'm over here. Uh, <laughs> the training that uh, was going to, whether it be adopting it in the House. I was hoping you could uh, talk to me a little bit about those plans um, sure. after uh, you know the ethics hearing this year and the fallout of uh, Representative Weissman. Right. Want to take that? Yeah, I'll. I can take it. Um, yeah, the purpose of that was um, obviously there were some inconsistencies with what was going on, and so we wanted to make sure that for the House everything was solidified. And so under Rule 62, the Speaker has the ability to adopt essentially employee policy, and, and, and it isn't necessarily policy for the representatives because their employers are obviously their districts, right? So, and the voters in those districts. And so what the speaker did was streamline the process that was um, outlined by the res Respectful Workplace Task Force Committee that was set up by a legislative council. Streamline that, in that original policy, there was um, an additional committee and extra parts, but instead now it's streamlined and uh, house specific and re reviewed it through our lawyers to make sure that it, it was tight as possible to work in the interim 
between now and when House Ethics can, can provide a more substantial and comprehensive policy. So it was just, I, I, I guess I don't need to speak well, for the speaker, but it, it was important for him, I thought, to tighten it up. And <clears> so. So we did. We tightened it up. We made it uh, uh, very easily read. And so that, there, so, that, so that our expectations with our employees are clear. And that, uh, and that, and then the ethics rules are what govern the the behavior of the members now. But each year, you've noticed that we have a respectful workplace training that all members are expected to attend, so that they know what the policies are in the building. And I wanted to reiterate the house's policies that are that have always been in place and uh, well since 2018 but in a more formal way because we didn't want there to be any uh, misinterpretation or or uh, you know that there was a gap in our policy at all our expectations of the people that work here we need to provide them a respectful workplace and they need to do that amongst themselves and the, the elected members need to be very aware of that and how they fit in to that process. Now, what we had a, obviously a, a situation this year that, that self-corrected, the system worked. It, our rules make it be confidential until it isn't. And so the system corrected itself, and, uh, but there was questions about the policy and we wanted to clear those, that up so that there was no doubt in anyone's mind what our expectations are here in this building. Thank you. You, you have a question? Uh, here we have a pandemic question. I think most people view the state house as a, a fairly dangerous place this session. I was wondering how that affected how lawmakers function. What are your thoughts? What were your feelings of the atmosphere of the state house? Usually, as you know, I think that's mischaracterizing it. I, I don't know where where you get that characterization. I think that's mischaracterizing it. I I think that maybe that is a, a talking point for certain individuals. But I, if I look at my district, which isn't too far out of Boise, that they didn't feel that it was a dangerous place. So I, I think that that that's that's unfair. And well, and, and I'm just saying that hardly. I've been here in non-pandemic years and the place is packed with people and crowded this year when it wasn't. So I, I, I think that's but, but I think to, I think that's a different question then, Keith. If you want to know why people aren't in the building, then that's one question. But to characterize it as dangerous or unsafe, I think is unfair. So you don't think people thought the state house was was I think there were probably some people who thought that. I, I think there's also some people, clearly those of us who showed up to work, that did not feel that way. So I think to just make a blanket statement like that is unfair. Oh, a lot of people showed up to work here and mm -hmm. make them feel done safe. And, and okay, but a out, lot so. of people also showed up here that didn't. And so that's what I'm saying. If, if the question is, um, why do we think that the State House uh, didn't have as many visitors when we first started the session, I think that's a fair question to ask. I think to make a blanket statement like you did, I think is, is unfair. So. Well, all right. So. Well, I think most people are going to agree with me that a lot of people thought I disagree. That's, disagree. that's what I'm disagree. saying. Yeah, I mean, right. most, who's but most people? Right. <laughs> well, Keith, let's, let's go back to what we did do. <laughs> well, that's the, the question. Um, it's a much different atmosphere. I, I, I was trying to ask a very easy question, actually. <laughs> it's, a, it's a much different atmosphere. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the atmosphere this year with fewer people, regardless of the reason, and what do you hope for next year um, with maybe you know, less pandemic concerns? Well, arguably, there were more people because of the investments that we made in, in infrastructure here in the building. Starting last spring, we wanted to, and anticipating some of the problems that the pandemic may bring, we made investments in every room so that it would, could be connected, so that the public could uh, not have to come down here and that they could participate in committee uh, hearings and then the committee process in a way that they've never been able to do before. And uh, so I, I think that, you know, while viewership is always a uh, slippery, you know, we, we can't divine that, but I think that uh, we were plugged into, into people's homes in a way that we've never been before. Uh, and yeah, there, was, there were fewer people in the building, but I think there were every, bit as many that were watching it and participating in it uh, from other locations. Well, I think if you just look back to August when we had our special session, um, I, I, I don't remember a time when we had that many people ever 
here in this building, and that was in the middle of the pandemic, as, as which you mentioned, and yet this place was overflowing during that time. Uh, between August and January, we had the ability for, for remote viewership. Um, you also had other factors. You had, you had the city of Boise had restrictions on what people could do. How many people were gonna be able to come here because of the restrictions placed on from the city of Boise? Um, so I think there's a lot of factors that you have to look at that, um, along with the investment we had in the infrastructure as well. So if I can follow, I know Representative Blake's on disagrees with you that a lot of people thought this was- Oh, well, I'm not the only place. one. I, I, if you want to- This <laughs> speaker, and Representative, uh, what are your thoughts? Was this, were people taking a risk coming down here during the pandemic? I, I mean, it was a calculated risk, I guess, and each, each, person, each person made that calculation for themselves. But I, I believe that uh, the protocols that we had, obviously they're, they're much relaxed now as everyone is vaccinated or had it, uh, and we're getting way closer back to normal. But I, I, you know, to say that it was exactly the same is, is, uh, would, would be a, a mischaracterization, but to call it a, quote, dangerous place, uh, well, and well, you've been here every day, uh, nearly, Keith, so you are you can brave danger, and you have, so. It was, was obviously, calc you asked, do I, did I think it was a dangerous place? Absolutely not. Um, but, but people have to make those decisions every day, whether you're gonna walk across the street. You have calculated risks that we all have throughout life, and it's different for each one of us. It's different for me than it is for the speaker, than it is for um, you know, our caucus chair, as it is for you, and we're able to make those decisions. That's the beauty of our country, that we should be able to, allowed to make those calculated risks based on our own uh, personal factors. We made testing widely available uh, and quick turnarounds on that. We tried to stay on top of all of that. Uh, members on their own volition got the shots if and when they, they wanted to. And so uh, I think that we took the steps that we needed to do and at the same time perform our responsibilities. Melissa Davlin had a quick follow-up as well. And then uh, we should be about done. I, I'd love to get uh, Representative Monks and Representative Blaisma's thoughts on this too. Um, in, in all the sessions I've covered, I've never seen this level of tension between not just the House and the Senate, but also the legislature and the executive branch. We had the governor holding press conferences to encourage people to call lawmakers to oppose what you were doing. Uh, we heard it in this very press conference frustration with uh, the Senate. We heard it from the senators um, just a little bit ago, their frustration with you. So obviously a little bit of tension is expected and healthy, but is this level concerning? And if it is concerning, where do you go from here? From my perspective, we had a, well, we had a, a brand new leadership team in the Senate. And I thought that we worked well, uh, the eight of us worked well together. And, but uh, leadership teams cannot dictate the outcomes in their, in their caucus and, uh, or on their floor. And so the, the lines of communication were open, we ate, met, uh, we, the number eight, the eight of us met uh, tw two times yesterday uh, for long periods of time, 30, 40 minutes when time was critical, just so that we could iron out uh, any, any differences, make sure that we had all the details covered. Uh, we worked well together to, you know, it's always, you know, it, it makes great news to, to point to friction between the House and the Senate or the legislative and the executive branch. That tension, let's call it creative tension. Uh, at, at best, it can be outright hostility at worst, and I think we were at the creative tension end of the spectrum rather than the hostility. If I could, um, so I've been in leadership. This is my third year, my first two years. Um, this year, I, I will honestly say that the best relationship that I have ever seen between the House and the Senate, absolutely bar none. Did we agree on everything? Absolutely not, of course not. But absolutely the best relationship we've ever had. Um, I almost on a daily basis, I was talking and meeting with Senate leadership on one issue or another. I think our working relationship was fantastic. If you look at what we accomplished, how many times have we had significant tax breaks 
Not very many, and it's because usually the House and the Senate don't agree on it. It's not that they don't want to cut taxes, it's that they can't agree on what to do, and yet we were able to do that. You look at our transportation package, biggest one ever, we agreed on that. Um, our, our balancing of powers, or as I like to say, restoring the powers to the citizens, had nothing to do with that, the, the legislature and the executive branch. This was about restoring powers to the people. We agreed on that. Um, you go down the list, I think this was one of the best working relationships that I've ever seen between the House and the Senate. And, and I would agree with my colleagues, and I guess, I guess I would point out one thing that hasn't been covered, is we're all living in a time of heightened anxiety as a society, period. So I think whether you're at home or you're at work or you're here, that, that you're at church, it, it doesn't matter. We're all living under a heightened anxiety because of restrictions, whether you agree or whether you disagree, because of policies set by the federal government, because of ex societal expectations of behavior. And, and I think that it would be unfair to, to not expect that that heightened level of anxiety would flow over into the legislature, and I, I think that, that there was a, a legitimate feeling there. And if I could just add, because I, I, I didn't mention the, the executive branch, um, we have great working relationships with the staff there. Um, Bobby Joe and Zach, we, I mean, we, we constantly are in communications with them, um, with the governor's office, and I think, I think it's been as good as could be expected. I, I don't know how we could have done uh, had a better a better session with our working relationship. Does that mean we agreed on everything? Of course not. But as far as that working relationship, to be able to text, um, you know, Bobby Joe or Zach at any time of the day and ask a question and get a response, uh, we've been able to do that, and I think they've been able to do that with us. And and you can't ask, at least in my world, you can't ask for much better. Mr. Speaker, there were obviously times we had to agree to disagree, but I think it was pretty pretty civil the whole time. Mr. Speaker, out of all this, what are you most proud of? I think the roads package will will uh, give us the most benefit down the down the road. <laughs> uh, here we are in the uh, if not the fastest growing state, one of the top two or three, and we're experiencing the growing pains in each one of these areas, whether it's education or or roads or pol tax policies. We're there, and it's going to take some time to to transition from old Idaho into this new Idaho and it's a different economy it's a different uh, uh, but people move here for the old values and so as we transition into in whatever the future brings we've got to have infrastructure in, in place so I think well one of the good things about the road deal is that the money is tapped into is tapped is indexed it, it grows as the economy grows it will crank out more money that will address the growth and I think that that is a very significant uh, step. It's never been that way before. It's always been tied to gasoline or fuel taxes. And as, and as cars become more efficient, the amount of revenue uh, doesn't track with the amount of traffic. It's as simple as that. This is plugged straight into the growth part of our economy, which is the sales tax. And as our economy grows, so will the, the investments in our roads. Thank you. Anybody got one last question? Or? Okay, I think we're good. Right. Sure. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you guys. Right. Appreciate it.